Praise the Lord. Let's open your Bible this morning to Mark chapter 5, and we are, we are going to have a lesson here this morning about the great battle. I don't know if you know that you're in a great battle or not, but you are. Probably, if you weren't before, the moment you came onto this property and said, this is where I'm going to hang out, you entered a war zone. And we'll tell you how and why in a, in a few moments. But we're going to read this morning in Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 1. That's page 1296 if you have a really cool Bible, okay? So they came to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwellings among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. This was a wild man. Nobody could tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. This is a tormented, wild, and crazy person. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? And I implore you by God that you do not torment me. And Jesus said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. And then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also, he begged him earnestly that, they, that he would not send them out of the country. Now, a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, send us into the swine that we may enter them. Next time you get to thinking that as humans, we're just all that and a bag of chips. If a demon can't have a person, his pig is the next choice. Okay. So we're we're not really as great as we think we are. So he's, uh, and at once Jesus gave them permission. They went into the herd of swine. They ran down into uh, the Sea of Galilee and drowned themselves. And uh, verse 15 says, Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed. See, the guy went into town and said, hey, you've got to come out and see this. This is crazy stuff going on out here. So they came out to see Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion. Now, this guy was famous throughout the whole region. He was famous or infamous for just being crazy and untamable. And they found him sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. And they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home. Go home. And tell your friends what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. This was a notable miracle. Lord, we just come to you this morning, Father, with uh, humble hearts. Lord, uh, with the confession that without you there's no life. Lord, with the confession that, that you are grace and love and truth. And Lord, that we need you more than we need anything. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, this is the battle that we're in. And, you know, probably next month, not next month, January, sometime in January, we're probably going to, most of us, get a giving statement from the church. And if you uh, contribute to other nonprofit uh organizations, uh, religious or otherwise, uh, you will get a giving statement uh, after the end of the year, and somewhere on the bottom of that statement, or somewhere in that paper, it's going to say 
No goods or services were received for these monies. In other words, I didn't buy something, I donated. I just donated and I didn't expect to get anything in return and so whatever. And when I looked at that years ago, I started chuckling because we do get something. That's why we're here, right? If we weren't getting some of this, something out of this, we probably wouldn't be here. Would we? I mean, I wouldn't. You know, the, the church has a product. The product it, that, that the church produces or should produce, the product is the presence of God, the anointing. The anointing is a tangible presence of God. The, the word anointing comes from ointment, or to anoint means to rub on, to have ointment and to rub on. And generally, ointment is for healing. You usually put, most of us don't even think about getting an ointment for anything until we've got a problem. And once we've got a problem, then we've got to do something, uh, find some ointment to put on there and anoint ourselves or rub on. The anointing is the answer to 1 John 5.19. 1 John 5.19 says, We understand that the whole world lies in darkness. Or some translations say, We understand that the whole world is under the sway of the wicked one. Or the devil has is, is got everybody uh, bumfoozled out there, got them blinded. The Bible says if our gospel is hidden, it's hidden to those who are, have their minds blinded by the God of this world. The anointing is the answer for that. So I've been here pretty close to 48 years. And in that time, thousands, I don't know where they all are, but thousands of people have hit these altars, not starting here, but when I came to this church, we were in the little building next door, seated about 150 people. If, if there was half a person hanging off the end of each pew, you could get about 150 people in there. Right, Dave? Dave was there. And, and those altars, you know, so, those altars, so many great things happened at those altars. When we built this sanctuary and started moving over here, there were some people who wanted to bring those old altars over and put them in here. <laughs> we said, well, you know, there's no magic in that piece of cedar wood right there, and we got to get something that matches the decor, you know, and, and we're uptown now. we got a new building. But thousands of people have found Christ. Thousands of people have had changed lives and had deliverances. Marriages and homes restored. Our pastor started a Bible college about 45 years ago and tra has trained hundreds of people in the Word of God and trained people for ministry. A Christian school got started. I think we just celebrated our 40th anniversary for New Life Christian School a couple years ago. That's been a lighthouse and a refuge in this community compared to what they're going to get. I remember back in 1976, for crying out loud, Pastor Hood's daughter was in high school, and he would drive her over to Lindhurst High School, and she would tell him, Dad, if you knew what was going on on the other side of this gate, you wouldn't be dropping me off here every Monday morning, every morning, if you knew. And in the last 48 years, just about every struggle or problem that can happen in a church has happened here. Right before I got here, I, I wasn't here for this one. It was just before I got here, there was a church split. And basically, the church split was over the anointing. Because Pastor Ed was going out in the highways and byways and finding people like me and dragging them into the church. And God was doing miracles in people's lives. But the problem is, when we'd go outside the church on the way out or on the way in, we'd take our last puff and drop the cigarette and then people will go, oh, we got cigarette butts in our parking lot. We got cigarette butts on the front. And I, I got saved and delivered before I got here, so I wasn't one of those. But there was a lot of people apparently doing that. And anyway, there was a church split. Uh, in 1986, the levee broke over there. We had six or seven feet of water in this, across this property. Um, we got firebombed on Good Friday one time. Brother Rodney came to church early before me, and he said he opened the door out there, 
uh, probably about 7 o'clock on Good Friday morning and opened the door and smelled smoke and closed the door, called the fire department, and somebody had broken a window and threw a cocktail, Molotov cocktail in the office and started fires. Um, we've had op- the neighbors have risen up in opposition to us building any of our buildings here. This church has experienced many wolves in sheep's clothing coming in trying to uh, uh, cause havoc and uh, divide the flock. and Everything you can imagine that can go wrong in a church has gone wrong here. So why are we still here? Why are we still doing what we're doing? We are still here contending for the anointing. That's what we're doing. Last week or a couple weeks ago, pastor brought us a lesson about contending. Jude, verse 3, he says, earnestly contending for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. That's, that's our job. It's, it's, what we, it's what we live for. What we learned was we learned that the anointing is the tangible presence of God with us. In Psalm 139, the Bible teaches God is everywhere present. There's no disputing that. We, we showed a... Uh, Uh, a little video in uh, our Bible college class a few weeks ago. And when I started this semester, I I wanted to give our students a a little uh, snapshot of the immenseness of who God is. And and when I asked Allison for some information and she sent me this video, when we watched it, I was like, I didn't expect that. I mean, it starts out with the size of, of Pluto and it goes through all the planets in our solar system from the smallest to the largest, and then to the sun, and then to the galaxy, and then to, I don't remember what the order is, the universe and whatever is out there. And it said, this is only as far as we can see. And you only get about two minutes into the video, and the earth is not even distinguishable anymore in the grand scheme of things. And I thought, man, I used to love singing that song. There's no one like you, Lord, no one like you, no one like you in all the earth. Now I sing it like this. There's no one like you, Lord. No one like you in all the earth. We're only this big. There's not much when you look at earth compared to everything. He's everywhere. He's everywhere present. He fills all of that. But he doesn't manifest himself everywhere. He doesn't make himself known just everywhere all the time. We learned that that anointing, that tangible presence of God is what changes the person's life, what brings life to me. Without the anointing, what we are is we're a bunch of religious people sitting around talking about lofty ideas. We have to have the revelation of God among us. The anointing is the answer to 1 John 5, 19. The whole world lies in darkness is under the sway of the wicked one. And the anointing is the answer to that. So at the bottom of page one there, there, the power more powerful. We know there's a power, the power of darkness, but there's a power more powerful. In John 10.10, Jesus said, the thief only has one mission, to steal, kill, and destroy. But... There's a power more powerful than that. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you would have life and life more abundantly. In Ephesians chapter 2, the first four verses talks about in times past we were uh, children of wrath. We walked in the darkness. We were under the power of Satan. We were driven by our own fallen, deceitful, lustful hearts. But God who is rich in mercy in his great love wherewith he loved us, but God. So what is the power and where does it come from? The power that's more powerful. There's, there's power out. The devil has power. A lot of people think, oh, the devil just, he's just a toothless lion. I'll tell you what, the Bible paints a different picture than that. He's powerful. I'm no match for him. You're no match for the devil. Okay? So there's a power more powerful. It's the anointing of God, the tangible presence of God. In Luke 4.18, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me 
The presence of God is with me. He's anointed me to do some things. Or this anointing, it's an empowering presence. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to bring liberty to the captives, to recover recovery of sight to the blind. And he says to set at liberty those that are bruised. I'll tell you what, I've met so many, even Christians, that are bruised up people. You don't even know you have a bruise until you bump it or somebody else bumps it. They don't know you had a bruise there. And maybe you didn't even know you had a bruise there, but when they bumped you, you went, ow, and the first thing you want to do is hit them back. And they went, like, what did I do? I didn't even do anything. Bruises. Jesus says there's an anointing that's going to liberate us from that. In Isaiah chapter 10, the, the, the back story there is that the, the nation of Israel is oppressed. Their enemies have got mastery over them, and they're beating them down, and they're tearing up their land, and they're abusing their people, and God comes with a promise to them and says, you're not going to live like this forever. There's going to come a day when the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing. They were under the yoke of their enemy. You guys know what a yoke is, right? They put the oxen in the yoke. It's a weight and it's a burden that goes on top of their neck and it's got a a stirrup under the bottom that cinches it up and it locks them in. And they go wherever the master tells them to go. And these guys were under the master of darkness. See, the old te- when you read the Old Testament, if, if you can get the picture there that it's, it's a history of God working among people and after Genesis chapter 12, specifically among the Jewish people, the descendants of Abraham... And when you follow their journey, their natural journey is a, are parallel truths to the spiritual journeys of Christians. See, they, they got delivered out, they had an exodus. They got delivered out of slavery and bondage of Egypt. There you go. When you get saved and born again, you're delivered from the power of darkness. You're no longer a slave to sin, but you can walk in liberty. And then there's the journey that goes with them after that. And the lessons in in that journey are applicable to spiritual lessons in our lives. So these guys are under the yoke of, of, of bondage to the Syrians. And God says there's going to come a day when there's going to, anointing is going to come. This presence, this tangible presence of God, when it comes, it's going to destroy, I'm going to destroy their grip on your life. I'm going to set you free. Now, you know, my wife, bless her heart, thinks that I can fix anything. (laughs) Don't you? (laughs) There's a couple other people around that think I can fix anything. You know, Brother Gary, one time he said, hey, man, can you look at my pressure washer? It just doesn't, I took his pressure washer apart I couldn't see anything wrong with it. I put it back together, and it worked. And I didn't do anything. I just took it apart and put it back together the same way it was, and it worked. So sometimes that happens. So sometimes when people have things that are broken, they can you take a look at this? But, you know, when I have things that are broken at home, um, I figure, well, it's broken. If it doesn't work, I can't hurt it anymore, Right? So I just tear it apart, and sometimes I put it back together, it works, or I can fix it. And if I can't fix it, I destroy it. (laughs) Joel saw that side of me one time working on his car. (laughs) I didn't, but I wanted to because it was his car. But if you break it, you can fix it. You can get the super glue and put the handle back on the coffee cup. But when you shatter that thing, it's destroyed and it can't be fixed. And God says there's coming an anointing that's going to destroy the yoke and it won't get fixed again. This is, this is good news, amen? This is good news. The anointing destroys the yoke. In Luke 7, when, when John the Baptist was in prison and he heard all the goings on around Jesus and he sent some people and he said, go find out, ask him, are you the one that we're looking for or is it another? And Jesus said, when you go back there, tell him this, 
The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended in me. I'm the one. That's what the anointing produced. It produced life and changes and miracles and healings. That's what the anointing does. In Luke 5:17, it says, The power of the Lord was present to heal. God is everywhere present, but he doesn't manifest himself everywhere. It doesn't happen all the time everywhere. The anointing is reality. It's not religion. You get in the picture here? The product of the church is the tangible presence, the reality of God. It's not ideas. It's not doctrines. It's reality. When people want to talk doctrine with me and want to argue their point of view, I just say, I didn't get talked into this. You can't talk me out of it. That's just not going to happen. You talk all you want, but talk to the post. Don't, I, I didn't get talked into this. I know God. I've met him. The tangible presence of God is an experience in my life on more than one occasion. Okay? The anointing is the reality of God with us. In John 6, Jesus said some hard things about drinking the cup and the baptism and persecution. And almost every, but the whole crowd just left. They left. They said, we don't want any part of that. We're not interested in the battle. Jesus looked at the 12 and said, well, what are you guys doing here? It's like he was trying to run them off too. And they said, well, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. You are the reality of God among us. Where else are we going to go? To whom would we turn? Where are we going to find hope? In John 8, 36, if the Son makes you free, then you shall be free indeed. Religion can't do that. Religion can't do that. You, you'd be surprised the things that we found on this altar after church services over the years. We have found drugs. We found needles. We found, all, one time we even found right here, we found a bullet, a live round. And the person who left it there said, if I hadn't have found Jesus, I was going to use this on my own head tomorrow or tonight, whatever. The anointing is the reality of God that impacts a person's life and changes them. The battle is for the anointing. And I'm not sure, I don't know the mind of God in this, but I don't know why he chose this street corner. The corner of Jay and Arboga in Linda, California, a place that doesn't even have sidewalks. People, guest speakers over the years that have come from out of town to speak at this church, on more than one occasion, I've heard the, the expression, well, driving here is, has, kind of has a, that inner city feeling. I like to think we're kind of country. But we're not country. We're, this is, feels like the inner city Right, right in the pit of darkness, okay? But God chose this place to manifest himself. He did it. Throughout the years, there's, there have been notable miracles happening because of God's anointing here. When he manifests himself, things happen. The glory of God is a, when you, if you study the, the glory, it's a weighty presence. It's God settling and resting upon people and touching them. And in a moment, they're changed forever. And you can't even say it's because of this, that, or the other. I don't even know how it happened to me. I don't, I don't even, I've played it over in my head hundreds of times. And I, I don't even know, I cannot explain a miracle. I walked into the latrine in Building 2480 in Beale Air Force Base, April 4th, 1975, shot. I was shot. I was tormented, demon-driven, depressed. I, I was a wreck looking for a place to crash. And God came to me. His tangible presence manifested to me. 
And I put my hands together. And I never prayed a legitimate prayer in my life. So the only way I knew how to respond was I put my hands together like this and I looked at the ceiling and I said, okay, God, you win. I was talking back to a voice that was talking to me. And when I said yes to God, his power came down on my head and went right down to my feet. And I I walked into that place bound up in, in drugs and alcohol and smoking cigarettes and foul language and crime and violence. I was, I was a mess. And one touch from God, I walked out the door, and I, none of that. None of that followed me out the door. I don't even know how it happened. I, I, I don't even know, but I've seen that happen thousands of times in this church over the years. And because of that, we have never been satisfied in this church with regular old traditional religion. We're not interested in presenting a polished program. The ministry of this church only has one passion, and that's to present the product of God alive among us. A polished program doesn't change lives. It might impress people and get you to invite your neighbors and say, come and see how cool our church is. (laughs) Hey, we're not interested in, in recruiting or hiring the slickest silver tongue orators who can lay it out for you in a way that just makes you go ooh and ah. We're not interested in presenting to you whatever is the latest trend on the internet. That's that's not on the radar. We're not even interested in a comedy hour. I said something one time and it made a few people laugh and we got home from church and we're having lunch and it's either my wife or one of my daughters goes, who was that? Was that your stunt double? Because they don't think I'm ever funny, which that's okay. That's not what we're trying to present. We want the reality of God. But you know what? There's somebody who doesn't want the reality of God, and that's the devil. The devil hates the anointing because it's the only thing that breaks the yoke on people's lives and gets them out of his control. So... The anointing and the blessing that we have enjoyed here from time to time over these many years also brought us to conflict because the enemy doesn't like letting people go. The devil hates the anointing. It's the only thing that can crack his grip, that can destroy the yoke that he puts on people's lives. In Hebrews 10.32, the Bible says that after you were enlightened, you endured a great struggle, a great fight. What does that mean? It means after after you were touched by God's anointing, after your light came on and what God's real. That's all I knew when I got saved. I came out of the latrine, grabbed the first person I could find and grabbed him around the head and started screaming in his ear, God's real, God's real, he touched me, God's real. That's all I knew, God's real. Okay? After you were enlightened. You got into a conflict because not just you personally, but us corporately together. While we inherit that blessing, we get inherit the conflict. That conflict's been going on for three generations since I've been here. And sometimes we win really big and sometimes we struggle really big. But we don't ever want to give up the fight. We don't ever want to give up the battle. Because where else would you go? You're going to go and and park somewhere on Sunday and listen to a silver tongue orator that just is so smooth uh, that you, a person that you don't know, you can't get close to. You know what? Next Monday, a week from tomorrow, I'm going to be close to my pastor. I'm going to go up to the woods and cut Christmas trees with them. Hang out with them. You know, the Bible says, know those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord. If if we don't have God and his anointing and continue the battle and fight the good fight of faith for the anointing and the presence of God, then we're going to either settle for religion or we're going to go fishing. That's what Peter said when Jesus left. He goes, I guess I'll just have to go fishing. There's nothing else. Jesus is not here. See? 
What else are we going to do? 1 Peter 5, 8, the battle is real. Peter said, the devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And Ephesians 6, 12 says that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we do wrestle. Oh, yeah, we do. But it's not flesh and blood. It's principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of the air. So how are we going to win the battle? How are we going to see revival flowing for our families, our church, our community? Well, we, we got we to get in the fight. You got to get in the fight. Anybody ever seen, uh, I didn't, I wasn't thinking about this when I was making these notes, but has anybody seen uh, Teddy Roosevelt's quote about the man in the arena? Only a couple of you. You need to go Google that. The, the man in the arena. It's not the man in the arena. It's it, the people with the blood and sweat and tears and the struggle and the fight. And then there's people over there sitting on the side criticizing the people that are in the battle. Hey, we got to contend. In Jude, he says, contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. What was that faith? It was the reality of God among us. Those guys are sitting in an upper room, and they can't think of anything to do except uh, draw straws to find a replacement for Judas that betrayed Jesus. They, they don't know what they're doing. They're, there's nothing going on among them. But then God delivered something to them, the reality of his presence, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they all begin to speak in tongues. Contending for the faith is to pray in the Spirit, Jude verse 20. In Ephesians 6, it says, put on the whole armor of God. Put it on. Stand up and be the warrior that God called you to be. Now, I, I might be kind of oddball, but I select my coffee cups according to the day. we got a coffee cup tree. It's got all kinds of cups hanging on it. And my favorite one used to be my Arctic Circle mug because I went to the Arctic Circle to get that coffee cup. And then I got, on Father's Day, I got a cup that made, made uh, Arctic Circle drop a notch. It says, the best part about having you for a dad is my kids get to have you for a grandpa. But this morning when I went to the coffee cup tree, I started with the, the uh, Arctic Circle cup, and then I said, nope, I'm going to do this one over here. And it's... Uh, one out of Joshua, it says, the Lord is with you like a mighty warrior. Stand up and be the warrior that God called you to be. Walk in the truth. Put on the armor of God. Put your helmet on because you're, getting, you're in a battle. Get your sword. Wield your sword, which is the word of God. Get in the Bible. Know it. If you're having trouble getting in the Bible and knowing what to read and study, take this outline home and read every single verse that's in it multiple times until this outline is burned into your memory. Contend for unity. Psalm 133. Behold how good and pleasant it is when... We dwell together in unity, for that's where God commands his blessing, even life forevermore. And then, that was my introduction. Here's my message. <laughs> worship. How are we going to win the battle? We win it in our worship. Worshiping God in spirit and truth is going to bring me to victory. Hey, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Right, Joyce? Second Chronicles, chapter 20. We're going to read that one. Or at least I am. In Second Chronicles, chapter 20. Now remember, that Old Testament uh, Story, the journey of God's people in the Old Testament, their natural journey and natural stories have spiritual parallels to where we are. My friend Steve Smotherman used to say, all truth is parallel. So Second uh, Chronicles chapter 2, verse 2, then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, a, a great army is about to invade us. Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. 
Jehoshaphat, verse 5, stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem and in the house of the Lord before the new court. And he said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of the land? You gave it to your, the descendants of Abraham. Verse 9. If disaster, if disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in our afflictions, and you will hear and save. Yes. Verse 12. O oh, our God, will you not judge them, the enemies here? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us. Nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. They, start, they got a focus going here. He said, our eyes are not on the problems. It's not on this and that or on how to run away from my problems or where I can go to distract myself. My eyes are on you, Lord. Verse 14, then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, and he said in verse 15, towards the middle of the verse, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid or be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, it's the Lord's. Oh yeah, it's your, it's your battle, Lord, I'll just leave it to you and I'll go do my thing. Well, the battle's the Lord's, what, you don't need me, right? I'll just go do whatever I want to do and just let him take care of it. That's not how it works. Verse 17. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves. It's important that we position ourselves in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing. That's what position is all about. Anybody who's ever played sports against an opponent, you understand it's positioning is important. How to be in the right place at the right time doing the right thing will get you the success. Stand still, position yourself, stand still then and see the salvation of the Lord. Verse 18, Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites of the children of the uh, Kohathites, of the children of the Korites, stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. Does anybody here have a voice that's loud and high? I mean, if, if you don't start getting loud and high, we're going to go get Charlotte. <laughs> Noah, my granddaughter, has a dog named Charlotte, and her bark is more like a loud, high shriek. I'll tell you, she's loud and high, and we got to outdo her, okay? Let's see here. Verse 21, when they had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army. The worshipers went before the battle. They didn't come afterwards going, hey, you guys did a good job, thank you. They went before. The worshipers led the battle. They went out ahead of them, and they said, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. Verse 22, When they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir. When they began to praise and worship, God went into action. And they, had, they experienced a great victory. Because the people position themselves to praise and to worship. In Ezra, the task of rebuilding the temple began and continued in worship. In Acts 16, Paul and Silas were down in the dungeon and they began to sing and praise God in the middle of the night in the total darkness and the, the presence of God showed up and shook the prison and the doors fell open. The, re the revelation of the reality of God. So here's what we need to know. Be persistent. We have to be persistent at this. In 1 Kings 18, Elijah told his servant, go on top of that mountain and see if there's any clouds coming because he was praying for rain. And the guy came back and said, nothing. Okay, well, I guess maybe that's not what we're supposed to do. Well, let's go do something else. 
No, he said, go again. And he went back to praying. The guy came back and he goes, nothing. He goes, go again. And he kept praying. And seventh time he came back and he said, I saw a cloud. I saw a cloud about the size of a man's hand. And Elijah said, that's all it takes, bro. Let's get out of here because here comes the rain. Be persistent. Stay at it seven times a day. I praise you. Daniel prayed and worshiped three times a day. Sing praises to the Lord. Praise the Lord with harps and stringed instruments. In Hebrews 13, 15, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. The ad is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. So check this out. Worship is a choice. It's a lifestyle. Okay? In Exodus 32, it's a choice. He said, whoever is on the Lord's side, gather here. Since April 4th, 1975, I have never received a single phone call that said, hey, Brother Al, where have you been? We've been missing you. I've made a few of them phone calls, but no one's ever called me with that. I've got a Holy Ghost homing device. It knows right where to go. And when these doors are open, if I'm able to get vertical, I'm here. Because this is where I want to be. Those on the Lord's side just gather here. It's a choice. Joshua said, choose this day. Elijah said, choose this day, who you're going to serve. Deuteronomy 30, he says, I'm calling heaven and earth as a witness today against you that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, it's a choice. Choose life, not only for yourself, but for your, that you and your descendants may live. You're not an island. You're not a person living unto yourself. There, there are, there's a ripple effect that's going on here. As a participant in this body of believers at New Life Assembly on the corner of Jay and Arboga in the exploding metropolis of Linda, California, you inherited a blessing, but you also got into a battle whether you wanted it or not. It's just, it's reality. We contend for God's anointing. The devil hates that anointing. And let me tell you something about the devil that you might not know. He has been studying human nature for seven to 10,000 years. He knows you better than you know yourself. He never sleeps. He never takes a day off. He only has one passion, and that's to stop God's anointing from changing lives. But God wins in the end. I read the, I read the rest of the book. There's good news in this thing. Amen? Amen? And 2 Chronicles chapter 5, I printed out here on your, on your outline for you. And indeed it came to pass when the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking God. And they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music. We need some more instruments up here. We don't have any trumpets. We do have some cymbals. But when they lifted up their voice with all their music instruments and praised the Lord, saying, if you don't know how to worship, and, and we've, got, we've got enough newer people around here at, at our church lately that maybe you, you're not acquainted with, with real worship and how we do what we do. If you don't know how to get started worshiping, do it like this. What they said was, they said, the Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. I could say that all day long. The Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. Just start saying, when they started saying that, the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priests couldn't even minister. God, how dare you interrupt our program? We already, we got it all lined out what we're going to do today. We even handed out outlines that, so people can tell what we're doing all the way through. And you're going to mess that up. The cloud filled the house of God so the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud, because the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. And let us not grow weary in well-doing, because if we keep at it, we're going to get what we're after. And if we don't keep at it, 
We won't get anything. So this is my exhortation to us, part of it, that when this next service starts at worship time, it's not a, it's not a spectator event. It's participation-oriented, that I get my antennas up. You get really good reception when you get your antennas up. You get your antennas up, and you say, the Lord is good, his mercy endures forever. Don't worry about the, what the person next to you is thinking or hearing, because hopefully they're saying the same thing. The Bible says that you all, say that, that you all speak the same thing, right? 1 Corinthians 1.10. He said, I, I, I will that you all speak the same thing. So there's the thing to speak. So we're all speaking the same thing. Same thing. The Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. It's participation. And as we do that, that leads the battle. That leads us to victory. Our worship and our praise of God gives him his place to do what he wants to do among us. Amen? And what God wants to do is wants to set the captives free. He wants to deliver people from the power of darkness. He wants to, to, to heal you from your bruises, to set at liberty. He wants to free you from those wounds and bruises that you have in your life, from, from your childhood or, or adulthood or prisonhood or whatever. He wants to set you free from those bruises and make you a whole person that can minister out of those, out of those places in your life to other people who are hurting and broken. Glory to God. Lord, thank you.